in your life. Good afternoon, everyone. Just giving a few seconds for, for people to come into the, the webinar. OK, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us for this, for this panel on accelerating sustainable land use policies in the United States as part of um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, Solution Network's Zero Carbon Action Plan. My name is Gordon McCord. I'm a faculty member at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California in San Diego. Um, and I'm a, a part of a team that put together the, this chapter on this particular part of the puzzle for decarbonizing the US by mid-century. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is, has been a team effort, so uh, we're going to uh, plan the presentation according to the different sections that we covered in the chapter. So Jennifer Slaru from uh, George Mason is going to speak about siting renewable energy infrastructure, Mike Jacobson from Penn State on reforestation, David Cantor, my co-chair from NYU on soil carbon storage and biofuels, and I'll talk to at the end about uh, promoting low carbon diets and reducing waste, all important pieces of the puzzle for, for decarbonizing. Uh, importantly, uh, Grace Wu at NCs is also, was also a, a team member, um, a, a great expert in this field. She's unfortunately unable to join us today. Um, so, but I'd like to thank all of my co-authors and also thank uh, uh, the team at SDSN, Cheyenne Maddox, uh, Elena Crete, and Fiona Laird for uh, uh, helping us put all of this together. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give a little bit of background, uh, uh, the Zero Carbon Action Plan's work uh, is unique in that it's providing a medium term framework for thinking about policies at the federal level for reaching zero and decarbonizing the United States by 2050. But unlike lots of other policy exercises, this one is, is sequential in that it comes from two, a two step exercises. The ZCAP draws from and expands on two prior SDSN reports. They're called Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the US from 2014 and the Policy Implications of Deep Decarbonization in the US. And the reason that that's important is because the first step before having a, a, a conversation on policies is to chart out the pathway to decarbonization from a technological feasibility point of view. And that's been the work of SDSN over the last few years. Uh, importantly, the, the two reports I mentioned focus on the energy system, the transport system, uh, and all of the uh, all of the parts of the system that would that would get us down to zero. Uh, but also, the land use piece has been an important uh, will form an important part of the puzzle. Uh, and there's been a separate project that's been focused on the pathways to uh, reaching sustainable land use in the U.S. That SDSN project is called FABLE, the Food, Agriculture, Biodiversity, Land Use, and Energy Project. And so what ZCAP does with regards to land use is not cover all of the policies that have to do with sustainability, but really focus on the touch points where the modeling uh, that's been done so far and that provides very careful pathways to decarbonization, um, uh, what the interfaces with policy are to the elements of that model. So for example, we'll focus on what does the energy modeling say about the land use requirements for renewable siting, uh, about biofuel requirements for liquid fuels in 2050, uh, it, it, the, the energy modeling tells us that we, the land sink needs to store 375 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Uh, and the FABLE modeling, which models in an integrated fashion our land so that we can see when we have dietary changes and when we have reforestation and when we have changes in trade, when we have improvements in agricultural productivity and in livestock productivity, how much of, of do all of those changes add up to give us changes in the land sink? And that's, uh, it's only through integrated modeling that we can put all the pieces together and say, what's the actual policy challenge in a quantitative way? Uh, and what are the policies, what would they have to accomplish? So that's the philosophy of the project, starting with 
uh, a pathways analysis that's a technological pathway both for the energy system uh, uh, as well as for the land use system. And now ZCAP is presenting the analogous project was what's the set of policies that would uh, align us and put the country on those pathways that the that the integrated modeling has shown. So that's that's the idea. Next slide, please. And we'll begin with uh, citing the renewable energy uh, part of the puzzle. Uh, and my colleague Jennifer Sclaru at George Mason uh, takes us there. Hi, everyone. So I'm Jennifer Sclaru, an assistant professor at George Mason University. And I teach and research on the food energy water nexus. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody can see me. I think hopefully my video is on. Um, and I, so I teach and research on the food energy water nexus. So the confluence of those three systems of food, energy and water, uh, particularly the institutional aspects. So policy frameworks at international, national and local levels and uh, relationships between stakeholders. Uh, and I formerly was at the Department of Commerce uh, prior to my work in academia. Uh, so uh, experienced policy uh, from that perspective. And uh, before we talk about uh, renewable energy infrastructure siting. I just wanted to talk briefly about why we're discussing renewable energy siting when a lot of our discussion is focused on land use and food. And the discussion of land use uh, for decarbonization inherently involves the siting of renewable energy because that will help us to meet our decarbonization goals. And so then by its nature, it also involves trade-offs and synergies with food production. So our recommendations focus on mitigating conflicts between sustainable production of energy and food and promoting synergies that advance decarbonization while supporting both clean energy and food production. Next slide, please. So if we talk about the land requirements for renewable energy siting, uh, the model that Gordon referred to uh, the decarbonization targets suggest that ground mounted utility scale solar PV, so photovoltaic installations, will require about the land area of Vermont plus New Hampshire. So that's about 19,000 square miles. And the total onshore wind installation suggested by the model to meet our decarbonization goals uh, would cover about the land area of New Mexico. So between 121,000 and 122,000 square miles. Next slide, please. So in this context, we need to establish some parameters uh, for the siting that would enable renewable energy to contribute significantly to our decarbonization goals in an environmentally and economically sustainable and socially just way. So to do this, we need to address, have policies that address siting concerns due to environmental land use and social impacts siting and permitting challenges for long distance and interconnection transmission infrastructure and address the split federal and local responsibility for transmission and siting that interstate piece uh, of transmission and local level uh, siting of transmission. So the bottom line is that integrative policies will be needed to frame transparent siting processes and financing mechanisms for research, development, demonstration and deployment, project development and host community impacts. Next slide, please. So to address these siting issues and challenges, we need policies that mandate development of integrated spatial planning for interstate projects, as well as at state and local levels. And we need to include defined timelines for creation of these integrated plans in order to enable collaboration throughout the siting process, to promote effective financial planning for renewable infrastructure investments and to avoid lock-in of infrastructure that may pose long-term negative ecological consequences. So one option for this is siting on contaminated or underutilized lands. And the National Renewable Energy Laboratory estimates that about 2000 gigawatts of solar PV, so solar photovoltaic potential, exists on 20 million acres of landfills and other contaminated or disturbed sites. And this area exceeds the total land area of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. And if you recall, that is what our model said we would need that amount of land for solar PV. So we recommend building on the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency's existing Repowering America's Land Initiative. And that initiative identifies sites renewable energy potential and provides information on reusing sites for renewable energy development. But we recommend actually going beyond uh, just providing information and actually adding structure and incentives for renewable development 
on contaminated or underutilized lands. And we also need to incorporate benefits for communities located close to these sites, but I will talk more about that in a few minutes. And I wanted to highlight some lessons from New York uh, that helped us to frame some of our policy recommendations. The Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act, which was passed in New York in April 2020, uh, can serve as a model for federal legislation to concurrently advance decarbonization and sustainable land use. And that uh, this uh, act has authorized NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, uh, their Clean Energy Resources and Development, Development and Incentives Program to rapidly advance new build ready projects and prioritize renewables development on existing or abandoned commercial sites, brownfields, landfills, or other underutilized sites. Next slide, please. So in addition to siting on contaminated or otherwise underutilized lands, we can also consider policies to site renewable energy facilities on federal lands, but we need to account for and address environmental effects and establish content and timing parameters for environmental impact assessments for siting of these facilities on federal lands. Next slide, please. In order to uh, mitigate some of the conflicts that uh, might arise in terms of land use uh, and food for food production and energy, we also need financing mechanisms to support research on and promotion of small scale siting and distributed generation. So for example, agrivoltaics. Agrivoltaics, and I actually was gonna have a great background of me under solar panels with sheep, but I could not figure out how to get the background on com my computer. So just try to picture it. Uh, <laughs> ag agrivoltaics is the co-location of agriculture and ground mounted solar energy panels. So it is not the displacement of food production uh, in place and, and substituting renewable energy production. It's complementarity between the two. So solar panels can be placed to provide shelter for livestock and also shade for plants. And that shade can also reduce the water needed for irrigation. Uh, so it's a, a beneficial synergistic type of, of concept. And there are two, project, uh, two programs that I wanted to highlight that are already in existence um, in the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture that we can look at as uh, kind of a launch pad. And so one is the business energy investment tax credit. And this offers tax credits to sectors, including the agricultural sector uh, for a range of on-site renewable energy technologies. But there are expiration dates for these credits and they vary by technology and project start date. So we feel that a framing policy is needed to expand and ensure the longevity of this program to promote the decarbonization goals. Uh, the second program I wanted to highlight is the Rural Energy for America program, REAP. And this is another example of an existing federal financing mechanism that can promote agrivoltaics or other on-site generation by mitigating upfront installation costs. So they provide financial assistance to agricultural producers and rural small businesses for renewable energy system purchases and energy efficiency improvements. But this program would benefit from federal state coordination to disseminate information to potential applicants. And it can also be linked to other long-term policy initiatives, including programs focused on decarbonization outcomes, not just practices, to promote its use and longevity. Next slide, please. So if we talk about the siting of renewable energy facilities, particularly grid-connected renewables, we need to address transmission siting also. So we need federal regulations that fairly allocate costs for long distance transmission lines. We need transparent environmental impact assessment processes and timelines to enable accurate calculations of project development costs, time and environmental effects. And finally, we need support for research, development, demonstration and deployment to address technical challenges of conversion of our current system, which is high voltage AC lines to high voltage GC lines. And this is a conversation that's been that third point is a conversation that's been going on for a while. And there's been a lot of discussion, but it hasn't completely moved forward in the United States. Uh, it has moved forward in other countries. Um, and I think we are finally at a point where we can have that conversation uh, based on uh, 
the need to still address some of the technical issues and some of the economic issues, but it's becoming a much more viable solution that would mitigate some of the conflicts over adding new transmission lines uh, to accommodate new renewables. So once again, there are some lessons from New York. So they have a state power grid study and investment program under their new act, which identifies investments in distribution and local and bulk transmission necessary to meet the state's requirements under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And the program also authorizes an expedited permitting process for transmission projects planned for existing rights of way. So once again, mitigating some of those conflicts over new siting. Next slide, please. So finally, this brings us to addressing impacted communities. All of the siting that we're talking about will affect the communities that host these sites and downstream and elsewhere in, in a variety of ways. So we need regulatory and financing frameworks to engage these impacted communities in the siting process and in compensation decisions. We need streamlined, transparent environmental impact assessments with defined timelines, plus established funding mechanisms to address effects on endangered and threatened species. We need incentives for host communities, particularly when facilities provide interstate power. We need requirements that localities and states create transparent processes for host community input. And we need funding for green workforce training in host communities with program models and guidelines. Yet again, there are lessons from New York that we were able to derive. So the Office of Renewable Energy Siting under the new act is a centralized forum to promote predictability and timeliness of siting decisions. They provide opportunities for local community input. They provide efficient, effective environmental reviews, wildlife conservation considerations, and host community economic benefits. So overall, this very recent New York legislation offers a model for state level action as well as federal policies like the ones that I've described uh, on renewable energy siting that can contribute to our decarbonization goals through integrated planning, mitigating land use conflicts, and promoting energy and environmental justice. Next slide, please. I guess that's me. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see the slides. I'm Mike Jacobson at Penn State. I work in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management. And I'm going to just talk about the role of trees and forest and, and focus on reforestation as an important strategy. Next slide, please. So let's start with a little bit of history to see where we're situated here in the US and what's going on. Um, if you, if you look back at history, you know, around 1920, we, we were really deforested. So keep that in mind when we think about places to reforest. Now we have, have about 30% of our land area covered with forest and we have more trees growing than we cut. And importantly, um, most of our forests are private. So they have to be engaged in this reforestation process. Next slide, please. So just to tell you, the types of forest management mitigation measures. The, the one I'm talking about is the one on the top where we're actually increasing the carbon stock by growing trees. Uh, you could also talk about reducing deforestation, which is there are many programs in the tropics like RED that look at stabilizing losses. And then there's energy activities that also can mitigate climate change. Next slide, please. So I didn't put the reference in here, it got left out, but this is from Fogioni's uh, paper from the Nature Conservancy in 2018 on natural climate solutions. And they did some really extensive analysis of land use mitigation potential. And as you can see that um, forestry, reforestation and natural forest management by far have the most potential of any other of the land uses mentioned. There was about 20 of them. Next slide, please. So we based, and obviously in my short time, I'm just gonna talk about a few ideas and programs. Uh, we're basing our, our pathway on the White House report um, that was done during the Obama administration. And they talked about 20 to 40 million acres needed to, to contribute to these goals of zero carbon uh, by 2050. And um, other studies like the Forgione uh, 
went upwards of 60 plus million hectares, depending on you know, the types of land use and whether you include pasture land and things like that. So what would that entail to reach about 40 million acres over the next 30 years with about 1.3 million hectares, sorry, hectares per year. And you can see there the amounts of um, teragrams of CO2 that will be um, sequestered from this process. Next slide, please. So just a little more detail on, on the approach. So the idea is to take uh, sort of non-forest land and create forest cover. And those are sort of some definitions. We talk about 25% tree cover. But the important thing is where this is gonna occur. And, and that, that's gonna take some more work, but it's gonna, we, we're hoping it occurs on these ecosystems that used to have trees. Um, so if you remember that 18, um, 1920 slide where there was a lot of deforestation in the US, those are the kind of lands we wanna target. Um, obviously, more GIS and other types of work is needed to identify these locations, and that's not a trivial task. And then obviously private landowners, as you saw from that first slide, would need to be engaged, and estimates of reforestation can be upwards of about $900 per hectare. Next slide, please. So quickly, I'll talk about four kinds of funding approaches. But importantly, I mentioned we really need to lay out where this potential is and what the costs are and what the actual sequestration would be over the next 30 years. But I'll talk about each of these funding sources, the federal cost share programs, federal tax programs, state and local programs, and forest carbon programs um, in a little more detail. Next slide, please. So from the federal level, um, in the Farm Bill, there are um, cost share programs that provide incentives for conservation measures and either they establishment costs or one-time payments or they recurring annual rental payments. And here's some examples of programs, EQIP, Conservation Reserve Program. None of them are really dedicated to tree planting. So the idea would be um, perhaps through the farm bill or other mechanisms at the federal level to create a dedicated reforestation program um, and, and we could also look at it um, in terms of not only uh, as these other programs are on a per acre basis, but think about, you know, um, cost share in terms of tree planting at mounts, tons sequestered, or, or how well these trees are performing. Next slide, please. On the tax side, um, there are some tax programs that provide incentive to private landowners like the reforestation tax incentive program. It's been around a while. It's basically a tax deduction and then you can amortize any amount over that $10,000 over eight year period. But the program used to have a tax credit, um, which is a much better incentive because it's off the bottom line of your tax bill instead of off the uh, adjusted gross income. So maybe a way to incentivize tree reforestation is to reinstitute these tax credits. A couple of other opportunities, there is cost share payment exclusion, which um, could be increased or incentivized from that previous slide where I talked about those cost share payments. And then casualty loss deductions is a huge issue now uh, when we have hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, et cetera. And there's very little that the IRS provides in compensation for um, these, these extremely um, bad disasters with respect to climate change. So maybe through casual loss deductions, there could be more ways, um, and I could discuss this further. Next slide, please. At the state and le local level, um, you know, they, they have many policies uh, that they can influence because they deal a lot with land use like green growth, zoning, hunting and fishing and they, they do provide local to technical assistance to landowners. But on the property incentive so slide, can you just click the next? So what happens is with property taxes, we have um, development pressure and obviously it's a vicious cycle. So as cost of services go up, taxes go up and landowners are forced to develop. So actually every state in the union has a, a prefer preferential property tax to both farmers and forest landowners. They vary dramatically across states, but perhaps um, better incentives 
full property tax uh, reductions could incentivize more um, forest land use and reforestation. Next slide, please. And finally, the, the fourth program are these forest carbon programs, mostly voluntarily right now, um, since we don't have any mandates in the US, the, the Chicago Climate Exchange uh, created a lot of these programs and, they, and some of them are still going market-based approaches and um, the Nature Conservancy and the American Forest Foundation have instituted some, some projects in, in a number of states, uh, about eight states. And you can look it up, the American Forest Carbon Initiative that gives incentives to landowners. That's mostly on extending their rotations and keeping their forest forested. Not that you can't harvest, but the idea is to obviously um, get them some credits for, for the public good they're providing through, through um, sequestering carbon. And then there are groups out there like Blue Source who do aggregating of private landowners and large holders. It's actually, especially the large industry are really interested in, in these carbon markets as, a, as an additional source of income in ad addition to their timber production. And so the idea is to match up um, these, these uh, willing voluntary carbon sellers to the buyers who are mostly companies who want to offset their, their emissions. Next slide, please. So finally, I think uh, it's, not, it's not a trivial task. It's going to be daunting to kind of think about reforesta reforesting 1.3 million hectares a year, but incentives will be key, as I've tried to mention. I think a key issue is these recurring costs and, and things like um, leakage and what happens if there's a fire, do they, do they have to repay these incentive payments and can we vary the, the, the payments over time depending on the growth rates, the volume and things like that. And then finally, I mean, it's very important, you know, we talked about siting and all these other land uses that we're going to talk about. The idea is to complement, not to, com to compete. And you saw with um, that, that, that Fargioni a graph that showed uh, reforestation and improved forest management, number one, we want to complement that as well by landowners perhaps extending their rotations and adding more carbon to their forest, uh, match that with the reforestation activities. And then finally, the other measures uh, like the national forest being expanding, reforesta reforesting private lands, as I mentioned, and uh, land transfers and conservation easements can also play a role. So uh, I'd be happy to discuss this more in more detail and there's obviously more information in our report. So I'll turn to the next slide and I think it's over to Dave. Thanks, Mike. Uh, hi everyone, my name is David Cantor. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of environmental studies at New York University and vice chair of the International Nitrogen Initiative. And I wanna to talk to you about um, what we've written report on soil carbon storage and biofuels. And this is perhaps a good opportunity also to uh, outline what we, the scope of this chapter and of the broader report and what we don't include in this chapter, right? The scope of this report is really about the role, and this chapter is the role that land can play in helping to decarbonize the energy system and our industrial system, and also the role that land can play in uh, the widespread adoption an implementation of negative emissions technologies so and practices. So, so practices and technologies that remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And so what we don't consider in this chapter are uh, changes in livestock production, either on the demand side or much on the supply side, a little bit that Gordon will be talking to you about. And we also don't uh, look at other um, land management approaches like nutrient management, for example, both of which are incredibly important and dealt extensively in other literature and other reports, and we're happy to, to share those with you. Um, but just to be clear in terms of kind of the scope of what we're looking at here. And so one of those important negative emissions technologies and practices that we're looking at is, is soil carbon storage. Uh, so next slide, please. So Increasing soil carbon storage can make a significant contribution to decarbonization. Just one practice alone, uh, which is the, the use of cover crops on US crop land that does currently plant cover crops, could store an additional 100 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, which is much more than what would be needed from soil carbon storage 
to reach uh, decarbonization in the United States by 2050. Other practices that could be used include uh, better residue mas uh, management, the use of uh, crop cultivars with deeper rooting systems, better fire management or grazing management, and better nutrient management. So even though we're not explicitly talking about some of those things, they are part of the soil carbon uh, sequestration strategy. Um, now, there are four pillars that we, we identified that it would be very important to implement if we were to have large scale soil carbon storage in the United States as part of our decarbonization plan. And the first is a robust monitoring, reporting and verification system. One of the um, key uh, uncertainties and hesitations about widespread adoption of soil carbon is, well, how reliable is it? How do we do we have reliable manage, measurements of the short term storage capacity and especially the long term storage capacity uh, of carbon in soils? And so there needs to be significant investments in better uh, empirical measurements, but also better modeling uh, of soil carbon in different cropping systems, different climates, different growing cultures. Uh, and particularly how soil carbon responds to different environmental changes. Will soil carbon storage still be as effective in a changing and warming world? So significant investments in monitoring, reporting, and verification uh, are especially important. We, uh, we estimate on, on average of about uh, 250 to $500 million would need to be spent on such a system. Um, and then Secondly, there needs to be a significant increase in financing for existing conservation programs. So for example, one of the key conservation programs uh, out there today that I believe Mike talked about is the conservation stewardship program, which pays farmers uh, to um, adopt certain conservation practices and technologies. And currently its budget is $1 billion and we recommend quintupling that to $5 billion um, to increase capacity and financing for farmers to adopt uh, these uh, practices that would enhance soil carbon storage over time. Um, there are other interesting policies that we would suggest exploring, um, which try to address the fact that many, if not most environmental policies in the agricultural sector in this country are voluntary, they're, they're incentive based. Um, and so, that while th that is understandable given the political system in this country, it's not uh, ideal to get widespread adoption of best management practices. And so we would consider looking at other more innovative policy approaches such as crop insurance reform, reducing crop insurance premiums if farmers are adopting these more resilient uh, and, and, and carbon uh, climate friendly uh, climate practices uh, because uh, that makes their farms more resilient to um, climate change. Uh, or uh, conditionality, cross-compliance, where uh, farmers can only continue to receive certain subsidies if they adopt certain best management practices. These are ideas that have already been implemented in places like the European Union. But thinking a bit more innovatively, both at the federal level, but also at the state level, about new policy approaches. Um, then in terms of extension, right? It's it, the financing will only get you so far if you aren't simultaneously working with farmers to help them adopt over the long term uh, these new practices and technologies. And so we advocate tripling the current uh, extension workforce, specifically in the NRCS, the Natural Resources and Conservation Service, uh, which is part of the USDA, from about 12,000 uh, people now to around 30,000 which wouldn't just be good in terms of increasing farmer adoption education on these issues, but also would be uh, important in terms of job creation, particularly in parts of the country that you might not otherwise see such extensive job creation. Um, and then public-private partnerships, working with the private sector throughout the supply chain to help reduce food waste and, and recycle uh, that waste as um, amendments to uh, agricultural land because recycling of, of waste and increasing the amount of organic uh, inputs to agricultural land is a key strategy for increasing soil carbon storage. So some of these kind of circular economy approaches could also be very important. So now I'll get to, so that's soil carbon. I'll, I'll now get to biofuels now. Um, so just to take a step back, biofuels are actually going to be, at least according to our plan, um, an important part 
of a zero uh, of a decarbonized US economy, but a niche part in the sense that we expect most light duty vehicles, so your passenger cars, for example, to be mostly electrified by 2035, which means that the sectors that biofuels would be used in would be in those sectors that are harder to electrify. So think heavy duty vehicles, think aviation, <clears throat> think shipping. Um, and we estimate, uh, according to the fable work that uh, Gordon pointed out at the beginning there, uh, that about 80% of the biofuels by 2050 would come from second generation biofuels. So not ethanol, but uh, crops like miscanthus and, and switchgrass. And so we estimate that by 2050, you're looking at about 4 million barrels of biofuel production per day, which is four times the current production of ethanol per day. Um, so how do you actually get there? So we identify these three pillars that would be very important to do that. The first is increased research, development, demonstration, and deployment into next generation biofuels, um, specifically into non-food sources of biofuels. So by that we mean cellulosic, so from uh, biofuels derived from say crop residues or other waste streams, or algae biofuels. Uh, both of those uh, are quite promising and, and uh, we would want to explore that to avoid this food versus energy uh, trade-off that otherwise arises quite frequently in the discussion around biofuels. Coupled with that, and one of the key drivers of innovation in addition to increased R&D would need to be a strong policy signal and that could be achieved through a low carbon fuel standard where we would advocate, and you can read more details on this in our transport chapter in the ZCAP report, uh, advocate for a carbon intensity uh, of at least 80% below gasoline and diesel. But we'd also want to make sure that there were guardrails in there um, so that you didn't get conversion of non-agricultural lands into crop land, particularly land that has high so soil carbon storage or a, a particular biodiversity la value. So again, some of the same challenges that you see with renewable siting, you also see with biofuels, uh, wanting to make sure, uh, because there is a, obviously a finite amount of land for multiple uh, things that we need that land to do. Um, so we'd want to make sure that those guardrails are in place so that you don't get these unintended uh, negative consequences. And then finally, one also way to increase market demand for new biofuels is federal procurement standards. Uh, for example, the Department of Defense uh, consumes almost 100 million barrels of oil per year, right, is a huge consumer. Uh, and so changes in their procurement standards could send a very strong market signal and reduce pricing, et cetera, for these next generation biofuels, which would be incredibly important and something that would be easily within the remit of the, the federal government. Um, so I believe now I pass it over to Gordon. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. Um, so the biofuels discussion actually brings us, uh, dovetails nicely into the next topic. So next slide, please. Uh, so about 40% of continental U.S. land is pasture land and cropland for the production of meat uh, and animal feed. Uh, and, and this is really important because what it, what it shows and what integrated modeling shows is that the evolution of the U.S. diet is a huge driver on how this system evolves into the future. So for example, if the U.S. diet evolves towards what the USDA considers a healthy uh, a healthy diet, which would uh, increase the, the consumption of vegetables and fruits and nuts and, and, and decrease, uh, but not drive to zero the consumption of meat and other animal products, that would uh, significantly reduce demand and open up a lot of land currently used for livestock and for livestock feed for other uses. And so, for example, what uh, often the community, uh, when hearing about large increases and biofuels to satisfy the demand that David just talked about, where is that land going to come from? If it's not going to come from an expansion of the agricultural um, uh, of the agricultural land space in the U.S. at some other ecological cost, um, it, it what what you get when you reduce uh, animals animal products in the diet is you get a lot of land that opens up and could be made available for the production of feedstocks for these next generation biofuels and and this is the power and the importance of that integrated modeling when you're bringing in at the same time the the biofuel needs as well as dietary changes etc. So if we need to uh, really change the U.S. diet by 2050 uh, as a big part of the 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 puzzle to solve this problem. Uh, what are the set of policy recommendations at our disposal? Uh, 
Uh, so the first is that a lot of programs align themselves with the Department of Health and Human Services and the USDA's published dietary guidelines. Uh, and in 2021, we've got an opportunity to up those, uh, update those dietary guidelines uh, to really put sustainability uh, deep inside, uh, inside those guidelines. And so this is something that was discussed before in previous revisions of dietary guidelines, uh, but really putting them front and center in 2021 could align dietary guidelines uh, for, uh, for lots of federal programs as well as for individual consumers uh, and really signal the importance of making this transformation in, in, in what we eat, uh, not only for our own health, uh, but also for, uh, for planetary health. Climate friendly certification is the idea of, of following the footsteps of the organic food um, uh, uh, set of interventions where if you've got a certification, then you've got a subset of consumers that are willing to pay a price premium in order to, um, to access and consume products that are climate friendly. Uh, and that price premium would allow to pay for any differences in, in costs of production between the traditional way or what we've been doing until now uh, and, and a different um, a, a mode of production that would allow for low carbon, lower carbon emissions in the process of producing the food. And so that price wedge that the organic uh, uh, sector is now enjoying, uh, thanks to the last few decades of certification, actually translated into revealed preferences by consumers. Uh, doing that same thing for climate would, would allow for profitable production of, of lots of food products that could be labeled uh, climate friendly. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of influence of the federal government's food standards on provision in schools across the country. And so uh, nutrition for school feeding programs or, or, or nutrition guidelines for school feeding programs uh, would affect a whole lot of procurement uh, for schools across the country, emphasizing not only health so that uh, children are eating healthy when, they, when they're when they given food across uh, in schools across the country, but the fact that, that that food should be low carbon and otherwise sustainable uh, would advance and enhance uh, the contribution of the procurement of food inside schools or for school feeding programs uh, towards decarbonizing the, or, uh, the, the diets of, of Americans. And then there are lots of support for, um, for low socioeconomic parts of the population that operate through food. So the community eligibility provision, uh, which gives free meals to students in poor areas of the country, uh, the women, infant and children program, the supplemental nutrition assistant program, all of these uh, which allow for uh, procurement by the individual of food could be tailored in such a way to promote, uh, generate incentives for uh, nutritious food and for, for low carbon food. Um, and so that's that's definitely one of the levers that would have large impact in how uh, in how people consume food uh, through these programs. And finally, there's direct government procurement uh, of, of foodstuffs across all government facilities, uh, federal, state, and local across the entire country uh, within our Defense Department. The Defense Department is a massive uh, procurer of food products. All of these uh, procurement processes of the government could be aligned with low carbon uh, food options uh, and would have a transformative effect. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, we waste a whole lot of food, both at the household level, but also within retail in the United States. The last measurement was in, uh, in 2010 that about 31% of food produced uh, was wasted. Um, and so uh, obviously just for the reason I mentioned on the earlier slide, reducing these wastes uh, would reduce aggregate demand for food products uh, and, and lessen the, the pressures on land uh, for agricultural and livestock production. Uh, the EPA and the USDA have a published goal of reducing food waste by 50% by 2030, and there's a whole host of ideas on what, um, uh, what are policies and guidance uh, that can be given to the states in terms of, of doing that. This is a largely understudied and undermeasured problem, and so we'd actually have to put a lot of investment into standardizing measurements and collecting data at, at high spatial resolution across different actors in society to really know where most of the problem is occurring and be able to monitor progress as we make investments in trying to reduce food loss and waste. Um, where the problems have to do with harvest storage facilities, we could, uh, the government could back loans for on-farm harvest storage to try to make it cheaper to store, uh, to store food better and reduce uh, food loss. Uh, 
uh, we could, the federal government um, and then uh, state and local governments could invest in, in messaging to the population on the importance of food stewardship uh, so that people understand that food waste uh, uh, aggregates up to be a significant uh, source of pressure on, um, on the ecosystem of, uh, and land use in the country. We could um, distinguish sell by dates and use by dates such that people can distinguish uh, reductions in a product's quality after a certain date versus um, a, a product just simply not being safe to eat or safe to consume after a certain date. So uh, separating those two would be enormously, uh, enormously useful. Um, uh, certainly public reporting of food waste and recycling by private actors would be a, uh, um, a way to, to, to empower civil society and the advocacy sector to, uh, to shame bad actors into better improvement. Um, we're going to need lots of R&D and tech into thinking about innovative ways to reduce food waste across our society, and so tax incentives for that R&D can be helpful. Uh, and finally, incentives for recovery and recycling of food waste for, for animal feed and composting. Again, just another, another way to try to reduce the overall pressure on the system. Next slide, please. So, and I'll invite David to join me for this slide also. So this, just to conclude, uh, we've given um, uh, kind of more specific recommendations on the individual pieces of the puzzle, but then we also offer a few large scale recommendations on the integrated land challenge. Uh, and three of them are listed here. Uh, I'll let David talk about the first two and I'll jump in for the last one. Sure, so the first is essentially to set up a new government funding agency um, akin to what has been already set up for the energy sector and for defense, so DARPA and ARPA-E. We would suggest uh, creating an ARPA land to focus on all the scientific research that needs to be done uh, to try and address all these complex technical technical challenges of decarbonization of the land sector. So this could include, again, better monitoring, reporting and verification technologies for soil carbon, uh, funding into next generation biofuels, uh, funding for animal protein substitutes, funding for uh, better ways to recycle, retrieve, uh, and restore the quality of food loss and waste through innovations in packaging and, and other means. Um, so we see that as a really important overarching policy recommendation. And then the second is an interagency task force. These task forces are often put in place to deal with issues that cross the jurisdictions of multiple federal agencies and departments. So climate change, for example, has often had an interagency task force. Um, and uh, the, the fact of the matter is that multiple agencies and departments across the US federal government have jurisdiction over land, whether it be defense, whether it be energy, agriculture, interior. And so there needs to be a coordination uh, on these all these issues that we've talked about today, whether it be renewable siting, soil carbon, et cetera, um, in order to manage the potential trade-offs and maximize the synergies and, and just in general, increase the communication across these important energies, uh, agencies, as well as with uh, local and state governments. So uh, Gordon, I'll, I'll hand it over to you for the last one. Yeah, and just the last point and to be very brief because it would be good to get to the questions. Uh, all of this has to be underpinned by an analytical exercise within government that knows how to trade off all the challenges that David just mentioned. So we need to use our land not only uh, to act as a sink for the greenhouse gas challenge, but we know that land has to produce uh, the food that we consume and, and we trade massive amounts of food across the world. So whatever our solution is has to be embedded inside a coherent global economy on the food trade. Uh, we, we need to use land in a way that conserves uh, biodiversity and ecosystem function in ways other than greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we, we need to plan for urban expansion and, and uh, transportation networks and the, the siting challenges that, um, that Jennifer spoke about at the beginning. All of this uh, has to happen in a way where you're coordinated across federal, state, local jurisdictions. You've got public and private land ownership. So this is an enormously complicated problem. And, and an interagency task force uh, would require a set of spatial, spatially explicit tools that let the government 
explicitly trade off different scenarios moving forward. Uh, and those kinds of tools often, certainly at national level, don't exist at high spatial resolution. And this is a direction that, uh, that we have to move in uh, as a country, not only us, but all countries, if we're really going to thread the needle of using our land in a way that uh, intelligently walks all of these trade offs over the next few decades um, and, is, and is a part of the solution to decarbonizing society overall. So let's stop there. And David, I think you're you're moderating the Q and A. Um, and yes. I'll invite all of my colleagues to come back with their cameras on. Um, thanks everyone for all the questions uh, so far. And please, for, you know, for those of you who still have questions, we have about ten minutes for Q and A. So please feel free to put them in the Q and A. Uh, there were several questions um, for uh, Jennifer. A couple kind of around a similar theme um, around uh, taking. Uh, for example, local community and particularly minority community concerns into account uh, in renewable siting and then link to that these kind of rural versus urban political divisions on renewable siting. And I was wondering if you could speak speak to that perhaps. Sure, actually I would love to because my research has found some of the same findings that uh, some of the attendees were raising uh, in Virginia. So um, I have also seen this rural urban divide and this concern, particularly from farm owners that their land would be overtaken by solar panels or pressured by utilities to put solar panels there that wouldn't even be providing power for those communities. And that is exactly what we are trying to avoid <laughs> with our recommendations. So our recommendations are intended to focus on integrated spatial planning that encompasses uh, the energy and food considerations, land considerations, and also engagement of the stakeholders in those local communities. So effects directly on the communities, not just the economic effects, but the environmental effects, livelihood effects, food effects. So in doing that, we actually looked at, uh, I didn't raise this in the presentation, but we all, I also looked at um, American Farmland Trust Smart Solar Siting uh, mm -hmm. Partnership Project as a model for ways in which to engage stakeholders. So create their suggestion of, crea uh, of having a, a multi-stakeholder coalition is something that we could consider doing across the federal uh, agencies and drawing in local community stakeholders as well to address some of these concerns um, and ensure that the local communities are being heard uh, and, and that they are reaping benefits from whatever might be happening, but it's also the same reason that we've been promoting uh, use of underutilized or contaminated lands and not just promote and not promoting uh, farmland use. So uh, it's one thing if the farmers actually want that, their land to be used that way, it's different if they don't. And you know that those voices would need to be heard and that is why we, we framed it as integrated spatial planning. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, there's an interesting question here uh, for, for you, Mike, uh, from, and I apologize if I'm getting this name wrong, Josh Seidel asks about whether a reforestation program could be specific enough to recommend specific tree species that are unique to specific ecosystems uh, and, and what the risks if, if that weren't to happen. Yeah, thanks for the question, Josh. Um, Absolutely. I think we need to tailor our tree species to the location. And given that we have in climate change, we need to be thinking proactively of um, trees that will be still able to grow in changing climates. So, for example, I see you on the southeastern coastal plain. A lot of that area is traditionally longleaf pine. I think that's the kind of native species we want to encourage. Um, and so I would promote native species over exotics as we introduce this mass reforestation effort. Thanks, Mike. Um, Gordon, for you, given, you know, you're presenting on the, on, on the food and dietary side, there's a question here about, um, you know, if non-animal protein uh, was to make kind of a significant inroads into the market, what that would, what implications that would have for, you know, the, our carbon targets and more generally for U.S. carbon? emissions? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Uh, I haven't seen studies of what the implications would be of really large scale uh, diffusion of these plant-based uh, meat product substitutions. They may vary quite a bit according to the production method uh, of the plant-based substitute in terms of its resource and energy intensity. Uh, my instinct is that they're likely to um, um, to be helpful. So if the counterfactual is that we continue eating meat from animals, then a plant-based meat substitute is going to be helpful. 
uh, make, compared to a, a, a world where we where we eat just pure vegetables and nuts and fruits uh, and reduce the overall meat or meat substitute consumption, then that may that may lead you to a different conclusion. But I'm guessing it's going to vary a little bit product by product, and and I don't know if there's an an overarching conclusion. Uh, in terms of, uh, of what's the percentage gain from the ecosystem point of view of moving over to, to different plant-based substitutes. But my instinct is uh, it would be helpful. And, uh, and the question is, how does it compare to moving, uh, you know, from, from, eating, for, uh, from eating steak uh, once a week uh, to eating a plant-based substitute of steak once a week versus just not eating steak at all? Uh, and, and I think that that's likely to vary by, uh, by product. Um. There's a question here about whether there's a big food versus energy conflict right now. I'm, I'm happy to take a first stab at that, but if anyone else wants to come in, you know, I think really the risk of uh, or the debate around land used for food production versus energy production is particularly looking looking forward as, as we continue to increase global population levels to a projected 10 billion people by the middle of this century. All those people will need food, all those people will need energy, and particularly as we bring more and more people as into the middle class, generally, at least historically, diets have shifted towards more meat intensive diets, and those require more land to grow feed for those animals. And then on top of that, you impose environmental pressures like climate change, which will make our agricultural land less productive. And that's where you really have this food versus energy debate, which is why, for example, for biofuels, we would emphasize uh, for research to really be made in ones that don't compete with with cropland, so cellulosic biofuels, so those that, that can rely on resi crop residues or or other waste streams like food waste, um, or from algae. Again, kind of trying to find ways to not compete as much with the food system. But again, if coming back to the animal protein argument, if people were to consume less animal protein, given that over sixty percent of the food that we grow goes not to us but to animals. Uh, then it would obviously free up space there. Um, we on, we have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, there are some kind of overarching questions that I think are, are, are interesting. One is about whether we thought about the um, kind of increasing encroachment, I guess, of urban spaces and suburban spaces into rural land um, uh, and, and the, the implications for agriculture, for biodiversity, presumably for renewable siting. I don't know if anyone wants to kind of jump in first. Jennifer, I see you nodding. Um, so yeah, this is something else actually that I, my research has focused on recently because the debate has been not just over renewable siting versus farmland preservation, but also uh, development, urban development, suburban development in some of these same areas. So again, I know I'm gonna sound like I'm repeating myself, but this integrated spatial planning that, that combines the stakeholder views and the needs, so primarily the needs, right? Needs assessments for these different areas and where where uh, the energy needs are will shift. I mean, I saw the question, it's a good question because the energy needs definitely shift as you develop these areas. Um, and that would be one reason to look more closely at where that development is happening and where that energy is being cited so that it is cited close to the community and you're not using farmland that could otherwise be used as farmland uh, to produce power for a community that isn't right there. Um, so again, integrated uh, spatial planning and stakeholder engagement to figure out how to best uh, model and map uh, the siting of the energy to be located near where it needs to go. Uh, I think that also probably speaks to the question on, on wildlife corridors as well. This was a big part of Grace Wu's work with the Nature Conservancy, who, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, uh, about making sure that in addition to finding enough land to put uh, to, to set all these renewables that we need to make sure that we're protecting all these other land uses and this gets to the integrated spatial, uh, spatial planning work that you were talking about. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the time now and we're, we're kind of coming up to, to the end of things now and um, but I would encourage everyone this is the, there have been some great questions here and we really appreciate it and if you have any follow-ups um, to please follow up either with us individually um, or uh, with Cheyenne Maddox, who's, who's uh, very kindly and ably kind of been running this, this group. Um, and so um, I think with that, I don't know, Gordon, do you want to see us out maybe?
just to thank everybody, uh, uh, not only my co-presenters and co-conspirators here in preparing the chapter uh, for all of the time and the effort, but also to everyone who's who's joined us uh, for this hour. We This is very much ongoing work. Uh, we focused on the federal level, but we were just having a conversation beforehand and, and relevant to the questions that were just asked now for how much of this problem is gonna have to be solved at the state and local level. And so really making that translation of a set of policy recommendations for the federal government down to where the rubber hits the road on integrated uh, spatial planning locally is where a lot of the work remains over the next, uh, over the next few decades. So we'd welcome um, uh, communication with all of you who, who are interested in those issues, and we thank you for your time. Uh, and, and I see Cheyenne's sharing contact information, uh, and so is Jennifer, which is which is great. So all, all of that is there, uh, and we look forward to being in touch. Uh, and, and thank you to to everyone for joining us, and thanks to the SDSN staff for organizing uh, this webinar and the report. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining. Thank you. <laughs>